So you've just picked up a piece of surplus gear, say for example a British Woodland DPM smock. Obviously depending on the item, its era, and the manufacturer, all the relevant information about it will be listed on the tag inside, with this particular smock stating basic things like its name and washing instructions to more specific details such as sizing and manufacturer. However, on numerous different countries' pieces, there is an often seen series of 13 digits. But what exactly is that? Well, it's usually known as an NSN, which stands for NATO or National Stock Number, and can be found on just about every uniform piece, as well as almost every other military-related item issued by NATO members, as well as quite a few non ones too. So this is going to be a first, where the focus will be more on the logistical side of surplus and uniforms rather than historic or detailed, as we'll be looking more at the significance behind the textual information found through numbers and tags, if it wasn't already obvious from the intro. Simply put, we'll be talking a bit about NATO, what exactly it does and why military uniforms, equipment, gear, and literally millions of other items have a number related to the organization, then get a bit into how to break down those numbers for identification purposes. So where do we begin? Well, with a quick and simple history of NATO. NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was founded on April 4, 1949, when 12 countries, those being Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States all signed the North Atlantic Treaty, which essentially laid out a series of articles which made all parties determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of the peoples, founded on the principle of democracy, individual liberty, and rule of law. Essentially, this was a defense pact formed partially as a result of the Second World War, but mainly as a response to the then rising threat of the Soviet Union and Communist bloc, which would lay out and promote multiculturalism between the member nations when it came to defense and military cooperation. Consisting of 14 articles, the treaty established things like dealing with international disputes, ensuring peaceful and friendly development, military expenditures in regards to national versus organizational spending, responses to politics, sovereignty and other related emergencies or threats, direct attack, dealing with conflicts involving policies or other international treaties or bodies, establishing criteria that must be met before countries can join or leave, among more technical and bureaucratic elements. So you get the idea. It essentially formed as a defense organization between North America and much of Western and Central Europe, which sees the North Atlantic Ocean spanning the space between. That's the name. As the Cold War went on, four more countries would join, Greece, Turkey, West Germany, and Spain, while three newly formed nations, which had been colonies of member countries, would leave, Algeria, Cyprus, and Malta. Pretty much at this point, quite a bit was going on, and if you add in the 16 other countries which joined after the fall of the Soviet Union, as well as those participating in various forums, programs, initiatives, and partnerships, you have quite a few throughout not only Europe and the Mediterranean, but also Asia, Oceania, and even South America. Naturally, because of this, there was, and still is, a a lot going on diplomatically, administratively, financially, militarily, and for our story, logistically. On paper, the concept of a military alliance sounds pretty straightforward, and sometimes they can be, but when you throw in interoperability, that being the ability for military units and everything that comes with or is used by them to operate among one another, it can become a logistical nightmare. That is, unless a level of standardization is implemented, and when it comes to NATO, there is no lack of that. As a part of being a member, each nation has to agree to a series of standards in order to maintain the development and implementation of concepts, doctrines, procedures, and designs in order to achieve and maintain the compatibility, interchangeability, or commonality which are necessary to attain the required level of interoperability or to optimize the use of resources in the fields of operation, materiel, and administration. Now, since the 1950s, a number of agencies and offices have been tasked with standardization with the current iteration being made up of two primary ones, which work with one another. The CS, or Committee for Standardization, made up most mostly of representatives from member nations, it issues recommendations and policies relating to standardization. The second is the NSO, or NATO Standardization Office, which essentially carries out the actual process of standardization on virtually every level for every category. From there, you will see two main elements of standardization, both of which operate together but can be differentiated to an extent. Both fall under the NCS, or NATO Codification System. The first are STANACs, short for Standardization Agreements, which covers more broad topics such as conditions, procedures, processes, training, and so on related to all things military. So for example, STANAG 2033 lays out interrogation processes for prisoners of war, while 4172 marked the adoption of 5.56 by 45 mm as the standard round for all NATO service rifles. The second and topic of this video is the NSN, or NATO stock number, though sometimes referred to as the national stock number, which was brought about by and accepted under STANAGs 3150 
the Uniform System of Supply Classification, and 3151, the Uniform System of Item Identification. These two essentially created the classification system, which is essentially the more tangible side of standardization in that it relates to anything and everything that can be procured, issued, or stocked, and can be touched, worn, held, or physically used. As stated earlier, with the Alliance having a lot of moving pieces, a constantly evolving treaty, along with policies and new members being added, quite a lot was happening, and the same can be said for their standardization efforts. The Stanags that brought about the NCS didn't happen until the mid-1950s. 3150 was 1954, while 3151 was 1956. Before that, there were elements, but not on the international level, as many individual countries had their own system, with more fleshed out and extensive ones being seen by various allied nations from the Second World War, such as Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States. From the 1950s through the 1970s or so, many pieces did feature an inventory number of sorts, but they weren't the same ones as seen today. In 1974, the United States, with its FSN, or Federal Stock Number, a part of the SCS, or Federal Catalog System, which was one of the final iterations in a long line of US-based cataloging systems and the actual progenitor of the NATO system, and Canada, with its CSN, or Canadian Supply Number, switched fully over to the 13-character NSN format. The main difference? Two characters known as the NCB code, found roughly in the middle of the NSN. But with that mentioned, let's now actually break down the format. When you look at an NSN, it almost always will be made up of 13 characters, but from that, each are broken down into two sections, each of which have two subsections. What these sections and subsections are called can sometimes vary based on nomenclature, but pretty much mean the same thing. The first four digits are referred to as the NSC, or NSC. CC, which stands for NATO Supply Classification or Classification Code. However, sometimes this section is also referred to as the FSC or Federal Supply Code, but that usually is a reference to the older pre-1974 systems. Anyway though, of these four digits, the first two are used to identify the item as a member of a specific group, which are numbered 10 through 99, with the second two digits being the class. These classes can vary in quantity depending on the group as some number as low as 2 with others as high as 37, though technically they could go up to 99. Moving over, the following nine characters are referred to as the NIIN, meaning NATO, or National Item Identification Number. Sometimes hyphenated between the first two and the last seven, the first section is called the NCB, which stands for the National Codification Bureau, an entity which was tasked with assigning country codes as well as managing the codification system, which was the aforementioned STANAG side of standardization. However, a more common and straightforward abbreviation is simply CC for country code. These number from 00 to 99, with each country being assigned signed one, though there are a few exceptions and oddities such as the United States using 00 through 10, with 00 being used to catalog already existing pre-1974 items, while 01 was for anything that was created or added after, and 02 through 010 being given for both future use and as a way to acknowledge them for inventing the system. 11, which is for NATO-specific items, Canada with 20 and 21 due to a massive assortment of items, 44, which is for United Nations-specific items, 57, which was used by Russia until it was suspended in 2014 in response to the Russo-Ukrainian War, 67 which was given to Afghanistan but suspended in 2021 after the Taliban's takeover, and finally 69 which was alleged to have formerly been used by Iran, Iraq, or Taiwan, that or no one wanted it. But you may be wondering, Afghanistan, Iran, and even Russia having NATO country codes? How could this be? Well, that's where the four categories of NCBs come into play. First up is Tier 3, which consists of full NATO member nations which have standardized everything as a part of the membership process. Tier 2 is for nations which have been certified to be compliant but are not members. They more or less are on the same level as Tier 3 but are not actual fully-fledged members, though participate in a two-way exchange of data and management related to items and the NCS. Tier 1 is composed of countries that have a limited non-classified access to the NCS database but do not actively participate in using nor managing it and may not have a fully compliant codification system. Finally, are the remaining nations which either discontinued the usage of the NCS, never used it, or have very limited access to them. Apart from the US getting first dibs on 00 through 10 and NATO at 11, the order in which the numbers are assigned don't really correlate to dates or anything significant. Sequential numbers being issued don't line up with countries joining or anything like that, but early it appeared initial member nations were able to select numbers as Canada got 20 and 21, while Great Britain received 99, yet South Africa and Brazil, which are not members, were given lower numbers, 18 and 19. While still on that topic, it's worth mentioning that 83 through 97 were remained unassigned, Luxembourg has 28 but does not use it as Belgium manages all of their transactions, and Iceland has one too but uses various other nations' numbers, likely due to them being the only member countries
country with no standing military. But back to the NSN and the final subsection, which is simply known as the non-significant number, though in a way it's not, as the first three of those seven are something of a batch number, while the final four are specific to the item. Finally, it's worth noting that sometimes letters may be present within the number. These usually are treated as a sort of override to the group and class identifier, which can tell anyone looking at them that they're being stocked or treated differently for whatever reason. So let's now take a look at a sample tag and then move out from there. From the start, if you're savvy with tag shapes and font, you can tell it's a US piece. Looking at the first two digits, it says 84, which is for clothing, individual equipment, and insignia. This group currently has 15 classes, and the class this one is showing is 15, which is for clothing special purpose, which is actually the most common and general class of the group. Next up is 01, meaning it's a post-1974 US produced piece, and finally the last seven are randomly assigned. If you were to type that into the database, assuming you had access, you could figure out what it is. Luckily, there are a few websites out there which do a pretty good job of cataloging many of these items. So what is this piece? Well, it's a first generation size 44 short US Coast Guard operational dress uniform coat. Now, as stated not that long ago, the last few digits are randomly assigned. However, on occasion, similar items will be found next to or close to one another, and this piece is a great example of that. The 44 short is 570 1753, but the 44 extra short is 51752, and 44 regular is 51755. However, it's also a good example of how these numbers can be extremely different too. Size 32 extra short, the smallest available for this garment is 51329, while the largest, size 52 extra extra long, is 51895 meaning there's some 567 different items between them. Now, this particular uniform has an interesting size system which resulted in 56 different ones, meaning 56 different NSNs, but that still leaves 511 other items in between, and if you look them up, they are all over the place as far as groups and classifications. Now, occasionally you may see that some items will see hyphens between the sections of NSNs, while others don't. The usual reason they do this is to help split the sections, but also for much easier reading. Additionally, non-NATO nations that participate participate in the NCS can sometimes have varying stock numbers. Here are three examples from three different Tier 2 countries. First up is New Zealand with one of their older MCU tops. The number is only nine digits long and is properly prefaced with NIIN. This number shows the country code of 98 as well as the physical item's seven-digit non-specific number, but lacks the group and class code. Next up is one out of Singapore, which, like New Zealand, only shows nine digits. However, it's prefaced with NSNNO, which technically is the term for the full 13-character long number. And finally, out of Ukraine is a full-on 13-character long NSN, which aligns with most of the other Tier 3 nation stylings, hyphens, and all. But anyway, you get the idea. These are meant to help identify garments while keeping them standardized, at least in NATO catalog requirements. While on a roll of showcasing the tags of pieces, let's look at one more example which comes from the US's FCS and is a good example of a pre-NATO catalog system. Right here we have two seemingly identical US M16 magazine ammo pouches from the Alice system. First introduced in the early 1970s, this system actually changed a few times seeing slight modifications to existing pieces, updates, additional features added, and nomenclatures changed. Anywho, if we open them up and look at the inside flap, you can see that they again appear identical, but upon closer inspection of the stamp, you'll see that the one on the left is dated 1974 and is marked as a part of the M1972 system, which was redesignated Alice, granted with a few slight changes not long after. Now, moving over to the one on the right, you can see that most of the information on the stamp is the same, save the contract number showing a 2002 production date. When looking at the stock numbers between the two, though, the 1974 dated one is 8465-001-6482, which lacks a country code, while the one on the right is marked 8465-001. 00-001-6482, the 00 being used since it's a pre-1974 production piece. So again, you can look at these numbers to help to identify a piece, but they likely won't be in the NATO catalog. Now, we've talked a bit about the structure and meaning behind these numbers, but not really how they are assigned, and usually the process varies depending on the origin and significance of the item. It can be as simple as an already used piece not having one, something new being created, an already existing item being procured for a special purpose, and so on. The same item cannot be added twice, at least the exact same item. For example, take a pencil. There are different types, sure, but sometimes they may look virtually identical and be used for the same basic things. However, things like weight, composition, users, and usages will vary. Item 7510-00-281-5234 is for one of the most common pencils out there. The number two medium, which falls under the 75 group, which is office supplies and devices, with the somewhat redundant class 10, 
office supplies. This number was issued to it in 1963 by the United States federal government, but being as it's arguably the most prevalent out there, numerous other countries use it, and nothing about it is all that interesting. However, other types of pencils, be they looking virtually identical to each other or otherwise, can have different NSNs. For example, the Australian lead pencil graphite coded as 7510-66-067-4145 differs, with another being 6515-99-809-2638, known simply as pencil, was designated as a British item under the Medical, Dental, and Veterinary Equipment and Supplies Group, with it being in the Medical and Surgical Instruments, Equipment, and Supplies class. Overall, though some sound vague or generic, each differs based on composition and or intended usage. As far as what is deemed necessary to receive a number will vary based on country as each has their own management office. If an item surpasses a designated quantity, it will eventually receive a code. Alternatively, representatives of the product's manufacturer, government officials, or military members can also fill out and submit a form. Again though, the process varies based on country and significance of the item or items. Now what happens if an item doesn't have an NSN? Well, it's not exactly a straightforward answer as it can be due to a variety of things. Assuming it's from a NATO member country, it could be something such as an experimental prototype or very limited use piece, which may not be deemed necessary to enter the system, be it at all or quite yet. Alternatively, the item may be already used and is being evaluated and determined whether it should be given one based on anticipated usage and quantity. Or in most cases, at least when it comes to uniforms and wearables, it actually does, but may not have anything visible due to one of two things. First is that not every country prints NSNs on every item or tag, as it's not required so long as there are ways to tie the specific piece back to its number. Adding the number to it just makes the job much easier. Now, more often though, tags can be ripped out or damaged, stamps can rub or wear off, things painted over, stickers removed, and so on. So even if you don't see an NSN present, that does not mean the item does not have one. This can be annoying for collecting purposes, but even more so for logistical and issuance ones as owners and wearers handing in, switching out, or just replacing them on an official level can sometimes run into issues with the relevant office or officials. In a similar vein, you may come across certain items which have entirely made up stock numbers. Much like fake contract numbers, these can usually be picked out easily by the wrong series of numbers, overall digit count being off, the preface abbreviation or name being incorrect, and even sometimes placement or misplacement of rarely seen letters. Now this was just a below the surface covering of this topic, but if you want to dive deeper down, there is plenty out there with a few good references being the NATO Logistics Handbook, though there are a few additions, the Wikipedia page listing out the NATO Supply Classification Groups, and the Guide to the NATO Codification System, which too has a few different additions. But that being said, this looks to be a good point to end things. This was perhaps the most bureaucratic video done so far on this channel, but hopefully this basic history and crash course on NATO standardization and the accompanying NATO stock numbers numbers was informative and helpful to those who come across, collect, wear, or are just interested in military uniforms, gear, and equipment, and really anything else armed forces related when it comes to NATO and their numerous aligned or affiliated countries. If you enjoyed the video, perhaps leave a like and consider subscribing if you have yet to do so. If not, no problem, you can simply check back soon for more videos right here on Uniform History.